Let's look at verse 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Okay, if you have an opportunity, God wants you to do good unto everybody out there. And God calls it an opportunity. Opportunity. So, like communicate, for example, right? And actually, forgive me, I forgot to give you a verse on this one. So communicate, how we know that gives money, that means giving money, is one example, Hebrews 13. So let's look at Hebrews 13. Keep your bookmark there, and then we'll go to Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Notice that the word communicate would be referring to giving money. And notice what's very interesting that when it relates to giving money, it's to people who work in the ministry. Now, what's very interesting to me is this, is that I know that we want to avoid giving money because it has to do with the pastor involved. But what's very interesting in your Bible is that most of the verses that you look up tithing in the Bible has to relate to the pastors. Now, I don't like to say that, but hey, like what I said before, I'm not here for popularity, right? So I don't care. I just care about you. What's the truth? But you got to realize that fact. So don't let these tele-evangelists scare you. Now, if you're giving the money to the wrong people, you should be scared. And you should realize that you are gullible to give that much money to idiots like Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn, who just, who just spend a night out off of somewhere spending tens of thousands of dollars for one night, man. It's crazy. All right, let's look at Hebrews chapter 13. Look at verse 16. But to do good and to what? Communicate, forget not. For with such, look at this, sacrifices. See that? God knows it's a sacrifice. God is well pleased. Look who's tied with that. It's the pastors. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Why? For they watch for your souls. It's not easy to pastor a church. You've got to realize that. That's why you have to give them money. That's why you have to obey them. That's why you have to support them. And if you don't think so, then I would willingly give up my job and please take my place, all right? And I'll run away somewhere far away. But see, it's not easy to do so. Okay, let's look at verse 10 again. As we have therefore, uh, back in our main text, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. So if you have opportunity, do good unto everybody. Do good to communicate to the pastors as well as to everybody. Everybody. Opportunity, do good to everyone. Now, did it say all men? Yes, it says all men. So whether it's a screaming, screaming homosexual liberal, you got to show goodness toward them. Amen and amen. Whether it be some atheist who cusses you out, you got to show goodness to them. Amen and amen. If it's a person who beat up your family and killed them, you got to show goodness to them. Because if the martyrs have done that for hundreds of years, when they ripped off their wives' pregnant stomachs and tossed those babies into the pigs, where their children were crucified and burnt alive, then I think you can do a little bit of persecution, right? What they do to you on this earth. So let's show goodness to all men. Let's keep reading. Especially unto them. More, more so, you got to show more goodness to them who are of what? The household of faith. you got to do it even more to those who are saved. Now, you know what's really sad? This will kind of preach right here. People will tend to show goodness toward lost people more than they do with saved Christians. Can I repeat that? There are people, saved Christians, who tend to show more love and who feel like they can be more close to lost people than saved Christians. That is wrong. You got to show more goodness toward these people. These should be prioritized more than the lost people. So this one first, then the lost people after that. They're number two. All right, let's keep reading here. Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you. So Paul saying, you notice that I wrote a very huge letter with mine own hand. Now, you might remember back at Galatians in our studies, 
What did Paul say to the Galatians? That Galatians chapter 4, for example, I think. It was Galatians chapter 4. And then he mentioned at verse 13, Galatians 4, 13. And verse 15, he had an eye problem. Remember that? So remember, Paul had an eye problem. So because of that, that's why he wrote a really large letter. He wrote a really large letter. I remember Dr. Ruckman, he had trouble with that with his eyes later on in the years. Just like the Apostle Paul as he was getting up in years. So he, then he would write a huge uh, letters when he was teaching, actually. He would use a magnifying glass. I think my brother was there that time when he would have someone read the passages and he can't read them anymore. Yeah, so he would have someone doing that. But it's so amazing. This man was such a genius. He could tell how many more verses the guy should read or when he should stop reading or if he should go back a chapter or more if, he's, if he got the wrong passage. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing how the Lord used him. Anyway, let's look at verse 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. See, a lot of people, they desire to show their outwardness, the outward fleshy part on what? They constrain you to be circumcised. So they're forcing these Galatians to become circumcised. Why? Because they prioritize more how they look outwardly. Outwardly. That's the kind of churches we go through today. They judge your spirituality by how you are outwardly. So, as, so if you're, I guess if you're clean like a Mormon with a suit and a tie on, and then you got all the dress codes right, you must be a spiritual person. No, you are dead wrong. You can just be as lost as hell and even more wicked. How many independent, fundamental Baptist pastors have I seen who preached on all kinds of the specifics of dress codes and they themselves are pedophiles? How many have I seen? Yeah, I'm talking about independent, fundamental Baptist, King James only pastors. See, it doesn't matter how you appear outwardly. You can be like, uh, Bob Jones University, Pensacola Christian College, and I know all their rules, okay? They have all these kind of rules. And I know they're doing this to look out for them to prevent them from sinning. But you see, if you judge a person's spirituality by all these different rules, then you are dead wrong. I have seen many of them who are just as wicked or as deadbeat in their spiritual walk despite of all the rules that they followed in their campus. You know why? Because they're only doing it because those, that's just rules. That's just legalism. Their heart wasn't in it. Dr. Upman's school, he just has a few rules and that's it. He says, we just give you adult privileges here overall. Whatever you do is between you and God. As a matter of fact, even the snack bar, the guy gives you snacks for free. He says, if you don't have money to pay me, you can take that. I just, I just know that the Lord will judge you at the judgment seat of Christ. You know what people do after that? They, they, they pay back after that, see? See, what is that? That's spiritual. That's right. Not setting up a rule and term. And that's what these Judaizers' problem were. They are like, oh, the, you judge a person's spirituality if you're circumcised. Well, it's been 2,000 years. Do you think the most spiritual people are the ones circumcised today? <laughs> no, it's ridiculous, right? Lord showed them. Let's keep reading the next part of verse 12. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Now, isn't that interesting? The only reason why they want them to follow these outward rules, these fleshy rules, is because they don't want to be labeled in line with the Bible-believing Christians who are persecuted. So if you're a Mormon, just because you're following all the rules and the dress codes and regulations, you got to realize this. The reason why you refuse to be a saved Bible-believing Christian is because you're afraid of suffering persecution from your Mormon families, which is very true. In fact, it goes really bad and dark. Some of them involve some blood oaths, which is pretty scary. So you got to realize this. That's the same thing with independent fundamental Baptist churches and even Bible-believing churches. You're afraid. You're, you're trying to show off to people, I'm a spiritual guy, by this outward stuff, see? And you're judging people by your outward standards and rules. But you know what? Deep down inside, the only reason why you're doing that is because you're afraid to suffer persecution from your fellow preachers, from your fellow Christians, who are focusing only on outward things. Okay, let's keep reading right here. Verse 13, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. So that's true. Those who are circumcised, they don't even keep the law. They fail but desire to have you circumcised, but they want you to be circumcised like them, that they may glory in your flesh, so that they can glory in your outward appearance. <clears throat> so again, you can use verse 13 
again, Seventh-day Adventists, Black Hebrew Israelites, Hebrew roots, and Judaism today, you can use this verse to show them that you didn't even keep all the law. Not only that, I think they break circumcision more than keeping the law today. So you can even show them that they didn't even follow a basic thing like circumcision here. <laughs> so use that verse on them. So that was the uh, Judaizer's problem, trying to force the Galatians into it. Verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory. So God forbid you glory. Don't glorify in what you do outwardly in the flesh. You know why Gene Kim is the right preacher? Because I got the haircut right and the tie right and the suit right. That's right, right? No, you don't glory in that. Paul says you don't glory, what, in your flesh. You glory, this is good, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The only thing you should glory is the cross that you're holding for Jesus Christ. By whom the world is crucified unto me. See, the world is crucified to him, and I unto the world. I am crucified to the world. That is what you should be proud about. What you should be proud about and what you should glory in and Paul, he had the glory because he had all these marks. The Jews, they beat Paul, and the Jewish beating was 40 stripes save one. That's 39. But he had that several times. So if you looked at Paul, he would look like a person who went through a football game, actually, or who was a soldier who fought in battle. But guess what? The Bible did say that Christian, Christianity is a warfare. Sit next to that person and see if you feel right with God after that. Sit next to a martyr who can show you the whiplashes on his back. Sit next to Jesus Christ who has a nail print on his hands. And let's see how comfortable you are in church after that. And see if you feel like that you're spiritual after that. So if bad things are happening in your life, you should rejoice. You should be happy. You might say, why? Because that's something you should glory in. That's something you should glory in. Like... This is something that I can show off to God. Not the fruits and all the people in church, the scribes online, the souls I led to Jesus Christ. It's the pain that I bore for you, Lord. It's the sorrows and the tears that I went for you, Lord. It's those times that I went through small memberships, yet I did not quit on you, Lord. That is something that you should be boasting about to the Lord. You should be proud about. Don't be proud in the largeness of your church because the largeness of your church would just show, would be a tendency for more spiritual coldness, to be honest. Now, of course, God can use large ministries for, your, for his glory, but the tendency is that it's not. The tendency, it's not. Okay, now I want to finish this, so let's quickly do this. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. So when you're saved in Jesus Christ, being a circumcised Jew or an uncircumcised Gentile, it doesn't matter to him. But a what? New creature. So what matters to God is being saved. Not a Jew or a Gentile, but becoming a saved Christian. That's what matters to God. And you know what God calls that? He considers that person to be automatically a Jew. Not physically, but spiritually. You might say, really? Yeah, read the next verse. Didn't it say that? Read the next verse. And as many as walk according to this rule, so if you follow along this rule, where what? You are in Jesus Christ. It's not circumcision or uncircumcision. It's being saved in Jesus Christ. Peace be on them. Paul wants peace on them. And mercy. Paul wants them to have mercy. But he also calls them what? And upon the what? Israel of God. See, God calls these Jews. That's what he considers them to be. He considers them to be true Jews, spiritually not physically. From henceforth, let no man trouble me. Paul doesn't want anyone to bother him. Remember, these Judaizers were giving Paul a hard time. In fact, he was so much to the point that he said, I wish they were cut off. So Paul was annoyed with them. He's saying, don't trouble me. Why? For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. You know why? Because he has the marks. These Judaizers don't. They were afraid of persecution. You know what the people online are? Some of them are. They're real cowards. You know what their problem is? Their problem is, is that because they want all the support, all the people thronging around them in comments and all that kind of stuff, and they're afraid of persecution. Yep. Oh, no, 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 no. I scream at the liberal news media so that I can get persecuted for Jesus. No, you just retreat to your haven, the Internet, where you gain your support, your following. 
See, you're like those Judaizers, man. You know what persecution is? Being a channel that is persecuted and then all the, you're being a small channel, yet all these people turn against you, and yet you stick out your gods and boldly confront them. That is true. That is being a true person who's taking in the marks. In the church, you go through smallness. They criticize you for having a small church. You take that in like a soldier. Where people uh, criticize me for my age, for my background, for the kind of church I have, they troll inside and then they spy and they feel uncomfortable. Praise the Lord because I made them feel uncomfortable. My members made them feel uncomfortable and they just run away after that. And then the thing is, is that all this kind of stuff, that is the mark that we should bear for the Lord Jesus Christ. So yeah, we, it's a hard, we're having a lot of struggles, San Jose Bible Baptist Church, right? Online, keeping this church going and all that. But that is evidence and proof we're doing something right and we should take glory in it. We bear the marks. That's why me as a pastor, I can honestly and confidently say, you don't tell me what to do because I went through this kind of stuff you didn't. See? Okay, verse 18. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So Paul tells the brethren in the church of Galatia, Jesus Christ, let his grace be on you. So that's his closing. His closing, you'll notice in the Pauline epistles, is let God's grace be on you. That should be a good Christian thing. We should all practice that too. Let God's grace go with you. Let God's grace go with you. Because God only knows that we're only alive because of his grace. We were saved by his grace. We are kept by his grace. And we're living right now because he was gracious to us so many times in our trials, in our sorrows, and in our hardships. So thank God for that. Notice it says, be with your spirit. So in other words, we have our own spirit. This is not the Holy Spirit. This is a human spirit. This is proven at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says that a humans have their own spirit, which distinguishes from the Holy Spirit. 